But if there is a favorite to finish in the top two, it would be 27-year-old Josh Davis, triple gold medalist from the 96 Olympics. Most golds, Rowdy, by any American man at those games. You know, I have seen Josh Davis take a lot of races out very fast, but I've never seen Josh take it out that fast. And he's still ahead of world record pace of the half. Mark Davis looks like he's going to win it. And Davis sets an American record. He breaks a 12-year-old mark. What a swim for Davis. Welcome to the Ultimate Swimmer Podcast. I'm your host, three-time Olympic gold medalist and captain of the 2000 USA team, Josh Davis. Here at Ultimate Swimmer, we hope to inform, inspire, and encourage you to be the very best version of you, physically, mentally, and spiritually, on your swimming journey. This podcast is geared primarily for those of us in the aquatic disciplines of age group swimming, college swimming, para swimming, open water swimming, and master swimming. But we welcome all who are interested in peak performance, pursuing excellence, and swimming with purpose. So whether you are just starting out in the pool or you've been swimming your entire life, you were born for the water and you were also born for greatness. So each week we will explore the seven core habits of achieving greatness that will help take you to the next level in your journey to becoming an ultimate swimmer. This episode is brought to you by Breakout Swim Clinics, the longest running swim clinic tour of swimming Olympians in U.S. history. Breakout Swim Clinics has been providing swim clubs with the biggest Olympic names for the best prices with gold medal service since 1997. Go to BreakoutSwimClinic.com and bring some of their great Olympians to your team to help your swimmers break out. Bigger names, better prices, gold medal service. Break out with the best. BreakoutSwimClinic.com Welcome, everybody, to another Ultimate Swimmer podcast show. I'm your host, Josh Davis, and I'm super excited about this week's guest. She is one of the greatest breaststrokers of all time. She's a three-time Olympian, three-time medalist, two golds and a bronze, and she has set the world record in breaststroke over 13 times. In fact, 11 of those in just one year, in one season. And uh, so truly an Ultimate Swimmer. Welcome to the Ultimate Swimmer show, Penny Haynes. Welcome, Penny. Thank you, Josh. Thanks for inviting me. Well, I I am um, really excited about this interview because you and I are contemporaries. We were in the 96 and 2000 Olympics together and you were also in 92. So you did three Olympics in the 90s and into 2000. And so uh, I just really always enjoyed watching your career, enjoyed getting to know you and uh, really excited for the listeners out there to get to know uh, more about you and your swimming career and your life. So, so thank you for your time. And uh, maybe you could just take us back to the beginning in South Africa, what it was like growing up for Penny Haynes in South Africa. Okay. Um, I grew up along the coast, just south of Durban. So as somebody growing up along the water, you learn to swim at a very young age, probably around, I, I can't even recall. So it must've been pre two years old. And then I uh, started swimming for the school team when I was about seven and only really joined the club at 12. So most of my memories, if I look back on my childhood years, was usually something to do with the beach, going uh, bodyboarding, stuff like that. I did nippers and life-saving. And uh, I have two younger brothers. So pretty much I think our childhood revolved around sports. So if it wasn't swimming, uh, typically in South Africa, if you're good at one kind of sport, then they push you into everything at school. So I did track and field, I did hockey, um, sometimes netball, uh, long distance running, which I hated. A, a swimmer is not built to run, you know. So growing up in South Africa, I think as your some of your listeners might know, but I was in an era when South Africa was still actually um, we had sanctions against us, so we weren't allowed to compete internationally. And of course, for 32 years, had not gone to the Olympics. So my motivation, if you want to get into that a little bit later, really had very little to do with thinking that I would go to the Olympic Games or having the kind of aspirations that would be normal, I think, to young aspiring athletes today, both in South Africa and, as always, I think, in the U.S., that's interesting. Well, that's it's neat that you got involved in all kinds of different sports. I, I, too, did lots of different sports growing up, and I'm glad I kind of had that background, you know, of having a little more coordination, a little more athleticism that I think helped me ultimately in my swimming career. So it sounds like the same for Definitely. you. So what was the first big kind of epic swimming moment? Like, OK, this is what I'm going to focus on. I, this is, I'm going to be a swimmer and, you know, I'm, I think I'm going to be pretty good at this. 
Was there a moment in high school? Well, kind I, of I think, no, I think if, if you'll indulge me, I'll quickly just say that, like I said, I, I never grew up during an Olympic era. So I never swam because I had these aspirations of going, becoming an, a, a real serious swimmer. In fact, I, um, I just remember around the age of seven, I was swimming in the neighbor's pool and I beat their son. He was about two years older than me. So the mother mentioned to my mom, I had talent. And um, so off I went to the school team and said, I, I want to challenge. They said, I'm too young. And then I said, no, but if I win my event, can I swim? And they said, okay. And of course I won the event. It must have been breaststroke, certainly not backstroke. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, I grew up in a Christian home, attended Sunday school. And this is really the golden thread throughout my swimming career. I heard the parable where Jesus talks to the servants and he says, I give, you know, the master gives the three servants talents and to the one, five and two and one. Mm -hmm. And of course, talent being a monetary value or weight in those days, it, it stuck in my mind. This lady said I had talent and now suddenly, you know, Jesus spoke to these guys about talents. So I better listen up, you know. And as the story goes, I don't know, some of your viewers might know it, but, you know, the guy, he says, use these talents. And the guy with the five doubled it, the guy with the two doubled it, and the guy with the one, for whatever reason, he might have been lazy or afraid, but he buries the talents. He does nothing with it. And so after some time, the master comes back and he says, well done to the guy who doubled the talents to, five, uh, to ten and the guy that doubled to four, well done. And then he goes and he reprimands the guy who buried his talent and he says, why did you do that, you wicked servant, and kicks him out. So I remember I went home and I thought, oh, it's almost like this holy fear came upon me that um, someday I'm going to stand before my maker and he's going to ask me to account for the talent he gave me. And I wanted to be able to say I did the absolute best I could with the talent that I was given. Um, I never want to get there and hear, you know, why did you not use the talent I gave you? And that was honestly the golden thread throughout my swimming career. Because I think a lot of young athletes today, it's great that they love swimming, whatever sport they're doing. It's great that they have their dreams and their goals. But I, I think it doesn't matter what you do in life. You have, a, have to have a deeper reason for why you're doing what you're doing. Because in those moments of disappointment and when you want to give up, and for me, there were definitely three distinct times in my career where I was convinced it's time to retire. And had it not been for this golden thread and me prayerfully considering it, I would have definitely stopped. And, and one of those times was um, at the Olympic Games in Barcelona. <laughs> so wow. I would have never gone to, I would have never gone to the US. I would have never gone to Atlanta if it wasn't for this golden thread. I love that you mentioned that because yeah, it is important that you love the life of a swimmer. And that's what we talk about at Ultimate Swimmer. We love to work hard. We love to develop our talent, but Sometimes you need a, a little deeper reason that, yeah, you you mm -hmm. uh, you have a little deeper meaning of why you're doing things to help you uh, ride the ups and downs that every every mm -hmm. athlete goes through. So I yes. love that you mentioned that. Well, I'm kind of curious, what was the conversation like uh, to get to Nebraska from South Africa? Oh, real, real quick, just was 92 Barcelona fun? A lot of people say Barcelona was a great Olympics and um, a great city and uh, a lot of fun time, but but you know, what was your experience like there? Um, I must admit, first of all, I, it was my final year of high school. So I didn't think South Africa would go to the Olympics. There were these rumors kind of going around that we'd be readmitted into the Olympic fold, but I didn't really believe it. So my preparation was perhaps not as good as it should have been. And I didn't think I'd make the team. And to my surprise, I did. And so I went off to the games as the youngest on the South African team, totally unprepared for what lay ahead, be it the dope testing, be it the, those days they still did the gender verification testing. So, I mean, it, it was just epithelial cheek cells, right? But it's a freaky thought. So, yeah. <laughs> and then I get there and nobody prepares the South Africans when it comes to the cafeteria. So, of course, uh, open 24 seven, Nutella for the first time in my life. I really made the most of my opportunity in the village and um, in the cafeteria. And, when it came around to the swimming, I, I actually, I don't know if I was really overwhelmed as much as I was a little bit disillusioned because now already we'd gone through the dope testing and we'd gone through all the gender testing and there were these stories as to the reasons why you have to do that, you know. And so I was a little bit disillusioned with what people are willing to do in order to achieve this supposed success of a gold, silver, or bronze. And so 
my swims, I came away 33rd, 34th, which is very close to last place. Really thought it's time to retire from swimming, had it all worked out. And then uh, I had a problem. As much as I think God gives you talents, I think he also gives you opportunity. And what we do with our opportunities, you have to make the most of it, right? And so I was in the village. The first week, everybody else was you know, done with swimming. They go out and, and do their shopping or whatever they did, nightlife. I remained behind with this wrestling match in my heart because I absolutely hate swimming in that moment. With everything in me, I want to stop. If someone had said you'd go to the next Olympics, I would have said never, never mind the impossible idea of a final. And I can't even tell you how bizarre it would have been to think of a gold, much less two. So I think I want to stress to the viewers that when you're in these moments, these dips, you absolutely cannot see what the future has for you. And the only way to go there is to keep on keeping on. And, and for me, again, came back to that golden thread. So I was very prayerful about it because the problem mm -hmm. I had was I'd been offered this scholarship to Nebraska. And I was coming from warm, sunny Durban, temperatures of 32, 35 degrees Celsius. I can't remember what that is in Fahrenheit. And Nebraska, as you know, is not quite that warm. In summer it is, but in winter it's it's absolutely cool. something I couldn't even I couldn't even kind of imagine what it would be like. And I was not the yeah. kind of kid who wanted to sleep over at anybody's home. I liked my own bed. So why would I want to go across the world to a cold place uh, where I know nobody to do the very thing I hate, which was swimming? <laughs> So, but I was prayerful about it and I felt like once again, like the Lord was saying, if I don't go, if I don't take the opportunity, can I honestly say I've done the best I could with the talent I'd been given? So it was in all honesty, sort of a little bit of a deal I made with God saying, okay, I'll go for one semester, check it out. Then I'll say, been there, done that. And I'll come home, you know? Yeah. And so off I went. And as we know, eventually I stuck it out there after many ups and downs, very homesick but eventually I learned to enjoy it a lot. And, and it, were it not for the U.S., for Nebraska, the opportunity of experiencing, I think, also the shift in mindset that you get when you swim in the United States. I think for you guys, you wouldn't really know the difference, but it's always my biggest reason why I encourage people who go to the States is not because they have the best coaches, which obviously I do believe your coaches are much better, especially the one at Oklahoma Christian. Um, Thank you. <laughs> but you. Um, but I, I also think it's that frequent competition, you know, and it just gives you a different mindset to what we would be able to achieve here in South Africa anyway. And uh, so, yeah, that's how I ended up in Nebraska. So Barcelona, was it fun? Um, to be very honest, it was a good learning curve. It was something that had to happen. But I can't say it was certainly not my happiest um, yeah. competition. Yeah. It was well, an adjustment. It's, it's, yeah. It's like the first big meet for a lot of people. You just kind of eyes mm -hmm. wide open, trying to check it all out and absorb it. And then you go back the next time. You're like, okay. I know what to expect now. I know how to, to do this now. And you can kind of get your, yeah. get your blinders on and just do your, do your job. Well, that's interesting. Well, I, uh, I love that you came to Nebraska and came to America to, to race because it is a, this, you know, you jump into this big machine and you mm -hmm. learn how to survive in it. And, you know, some good things can happen. And yeah. uh, Cal, Cal Benz, I just have memories of him being a great guy, a great coach and uh, putting together a really eclectic group of athletes at Nebraska. And you guys were, you know, winning, you know, moving up in the ranks pretty fast with, with this incredible set of yeah. for, foreigners and American kids that were going real fast. And um, so just, just, your your general uh, take on your four years there, what, you know, just what was your major? What were some of the some of the things you think you took away from that that four years there? So I studied psychology. Um, I think in my four years, it it was the re obviously the friendships you make, um, and I think I I always think back to Nebraska very fondly. Um, I met some great people there, people who obviously had quite a profound influence on my life, spiritually speaking as well, actually. And I think I think beyond that, in terms of swimming, certainly at that time in the USA and in the history of Nebraska swimming, we were, I'd say, at our peak. Even if I look back on school records now, there's quite a few in the top 10 still of those same girls that were swimming in my era. And there was a lot of foreigners, like you say, it was probably at least a 50-50 split, if not more foreigners. So that made it a little bit more comfortable. Yeah. But um, I just say, I think I'm very grateful that I did end up going to Nebraska, that I was in the Midwest. Um, you know, I, I love America. I think there are many 
um, other states that that could have that I would have loved just as much. But I'm I'm glad to say that I went to a place where it wasn't so easy because I think the struggles, the challenges of also just dealing, it's a simple thing for those who grow up in that cold weather all your life. But for someone like me coming from South Africa, it was a huge adjustment and mentally very challenging. And I'm grateful for all of that because I think it it forced me to become mentally strong in, in a certain way that I perhaps otherwise wouldn't have. And I'm always someone that thinks that in order to believe and let's say, have the right to achieve, you got to make a lot of sacrifice. And so for me, in a way, just making the huge sacrifices and being in an environment that's not always so easy meant that therefore I can deserve to believe that that I can achieve what I eventually did. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, it's, and it's hard to communicate to someone outside swimming and even outside collegiate swimming how difficult that schedule is. That is the hardest schedule a young person can take on is swimming nine times a week, making good grades in college, the lifting three, three times a week, and then trying to have a social life and a spiritual life. And so it doesn't come by accident that you were able to stay strong spiritually. What are something, some practical things that you did while in college, you know, for me, you know, I, I, I found a good church, you know, I was in a Bible study with some guys, you know, I'm, you know, before we had our, our smartphones that could read the Bible to us, you know, you kind of had to take time to read the actual real Bible. Um, yeah. So what were some things you did in that season to stay spiritually strong? I think as if we're honest, maybe not everybody, but most of us, when you go to college, you do go through that roller coaster. So when I arrived there, I felt because I was so alone, it was an awesome time, spiritually speaking, because I just had to be so dependent on the Lord. But then you kind of get into your comfort zone and you're right. And I didn't quite settle into a church immediately. I, I didn't kind of find my feet. But then I was very blessed that eventually I did. And out of that grew um, some really good friendships of fellow believers. And, you know, we formed a very nice Bible study group which eventually there were, I'm, I'm pleased to say, quite a few of the other swimmers on the team eventually started coming as well. Um, how did I manage it? I think, I think it just came back to realizing that it, it always felt to me like my journey in my swimming career was very much a faith walk as well. So because I went through those tough times, and, and I, I say this jokingly, but it's absolutely the truth. I would swim up and down that black line crying in my goggles. I, I hated it, especially the first semester. And so then it got to a point where I needed to – obviously, I was very prayerful about it. And um, every step of the way, you know, there was, this, there was a scripture that said, whatever you do, I think it's in Colossians 7, 17 and 23, says something along the same lines, but whatever you do, do it with all your heart as unto God and not man. And I realized, wow, you know, if I don't change my attitude, if I don't um, find a way to focus my mind on the details of what I'm doing, which would then mean I can't think about all the stuff I'm grumpy about and complaining about, you know, then my swimming can improve. And of course, with that, as I say, it was very much a spiritual journey. I, I, I still, even if I look back at Atlanta, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. You know, people often ask me what happened when you – the, you know, after the 200 breaths, now you have the two goals, you know, what did you do? And I just remember I went back to my room and I was, again, almost this holy fear of, oh, no, what now, Lord? What are you up to? And why me? And what kind of responsibility goes along with this, you know? Um, almost a little bit suspicious right. of what's going on here, you know? And so for me that that it was very hard to separate the swimming and my and my faith walk which obviously I think it's the way it should be and were it not for that were it not for my relationship with the lord there's no way I would have stuck it out in Nebraska first of all I probably wouldn't have gone in in the first place but I definitely wouldn't have stayed <laughs> yeah that's that's fascinating yeah. I love that did you go to 94 worlds in Rome I can't remember if yeah, you went I did. over to big turning point that yeah. was a big turning point. Because that, that was a cool meet. I was, I was there for the relays for, for USA, and I just I fell in love with Italy, fell in love with the food and the people, and the, that stadium was very cool, and then that was a great meet. Yeah. And I personally didn't have a good meet, but uh, I wanted to get your, your take on what, what Rome was like, was like for you. 
uh, not a good meet either, but a very important meet. So, first of all, when we came off the Commonwealth Games from Canada, we went directly to Rome. So, at, in the Commonwealth Games, it's the first time I I medaled at an Olympic event. I got a bronze in the 100. And so, we went off to Rome and there were some expectations and... and um, as for Rome itself, it was quite great. We had a, the hotel we had had its own 50 meter pool. So for the week preceding the champs, we could just train right there at the hotel, which was awesome. Wow. Most other countries had to go into town. So that was really nice. And of course, the Aussies and the Chinese would come in and train there. So I could check them out and see what they're up to. But the long and short of it is in the, in the heats of the hundred breasts, I swam in the second to last heat and I qualified with a personal best time a, a South African record and I, I it got me in a second seed going into the final so that was a big moment and then in the final even though I had every intention to swim my own race you know as I dove in I caught a glimpse of Samantha Riley next to me and that just threw me off so I ended up coming sixth with a time that was almost a second slower than I'd gone in the morning oh, the girl wow. who got the bronze ended up swimming slower than I had in the morning. So once again, I'm walking down the length of the pool, telling myself this is a good time to retire from swimming and I have all my reasons worked out. And now it's a done deal because I'm in one of these moments again. And I get up there, my parents happened to be there. That was the first time they saw me swim internationally. And I sat down and they said, well done, next time better. And I said, no, I'm retiring, I'm coming home. I give them my whole spiel of why. And mm -hmm. then my mother said to me, okay, that's fine. You know, you can retire, come home, we'll support you. It'll, you know, we're very proud of you. And then you can wonder what if. <laughs> so that was like a dagger. <laughs> she just put in that this little is, this is what you, Yeah, this is, this is what you call um, firmly encouraging someone, aka manipulation. Yeah. So yeah. she said, all you can choose. And this is like, I always say in my talks, you know, God gives you talent, he gives opportunity, and then he gives you the power of free will, choice. And the choices we make are very, very important. And we shouldn't make them on the whim of an emotion because in that moment, my emotion said, I hate swimming, I'm going to stop. But she said, you can choose to look at this, you know, um, perceived failure and learn from it. And in her words, she said, these are their line of nuggets of truth in your failures, the things you need to learn that are catapult you onto tomorrow's successes. And this was exactly two years before Atlanta. Right. And so that experience... Um, that really bad swim. Um, and, and then because of that, the things I was forced to learn from that failure, I really believe is the, is the reason why I had the results I had in Atlanta. In other words, if Rome's failure did not happen, the successes of Atlanta would not have happened. And I, I'm 100% certain of that. Yeah, I think when so, we, a lot of us look back on our career, was, we learned a lot more in the failures and in the valleys oh yeah. to kind of set us up for a few mountaintops. So... I love Definitely. that. I wanted to take a moment from this fascinating interview to let you know about a new partner for the Ultimate Swimmer podcast, and that is Swimshare. Swimshare is a free workout riding tool. Just Google Swimshare, all one word, Swimshare. And you can put in today's workout in just a few clicks, and it sends and stores all your workouts within seconds. The first workout you'll see on there is one of my favorites from yours truly. Check out Swimshare. And take your workouts to the next level. Send, store, and share your swimming masterpieces with Swimshare. So where did you train from 94 to 96? Was it, was it still in Nebraska? Yeah, yeah, it was in Nebraska. So I, I arrived in Nebraska in January. So I went into the second semester um, of 93. So I was there. I, I graduated at NC's 96. NCAA is 96. Yeah. So the timing was pretty good for me. Yeah. Yeah. So you so can just stick around. Mm. So you could just stick around in Lincoln and then just fly to Atlanta and go to the Olympics. Yeah, it was oh, it was amazing. It was great. So I, I really yeah. felt like there were so many positives to Atlanta that were unique to Atlanta, I believe, at mm -hmm. least from the games i I have attended. Um, one of them being for me, obviously, the fact that it was home away from home. Being in America, it was it was as if I had you know, a home, hometown Olympics. Yeah. But I think one of the greatest things about it, and I, I assume you would agree, is the fact that where we lived, the village was really back to back with a swimming venue. So we didn't need to get onto all the buses and the transport yeah. like we needed to do in Barcelona and Sydney. And so for me, it gave me a lot of flexibility. I'd like to, I always used to like go warm up really early in the morning and get a swim in before it's crowded and everybody else is there. And 
I didn't have to hassle with transport. So yeah. it was very convenient in that sense. And of course, being in America meant that uh, some of the coaches from Nebraska, Cal Benz, Kelly Nordell, they could come and we'll also watch. So that was that was very nice. Yeah, so it was good. So yeah, so a, a good setup, and then you do the which one was first, the two hundred or the hundred at, at Atlanta? No, the hundred. The hundred. The hundred was first, and so yeah. you do you do yeah. your signature thing with no goggles, and uh, you win the yeah. gold, and our Amanda got second, and boom, yeah. here, you, here you are on top of the world. And uh, then a couple of days later, the 200 double gold. And I was in the uh, media room for some reason, because I think I had raced that night as well. Mm -hmm. And so I, I remember watching you in the media room after doing a post-race interview. And, you know, basically, I want to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for allowing this, you know, something like that. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. Because I, I hadn't known you yet. And, yeah. uh, you know, I was a Christian swimmer and I realized you're a Christian swimmer. I was like, this is cool. And so I was just uh, fascinated with your your boldness and your clarity. And and I, I was just like, wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. And so maybe you can just take us back to just give us some highlights of what those two races, those two goals were like. And what were you feeling, you know, up and, you know, any ups and downs okay. in that week? No, I think in the lead up to the games, it was it was really good. I think the whole setup, you know, I, I broke the world record the first time at our Olympic trials in South Africa. So obviously I, I knew going into the games, there's a very good chance I could win. I can't control what others do, but I knew I would swim faster still. And so a very po important point, and I'm sure you did it too, that um, in the preparation for the Olympics, I didn't want to go there and be overwhelmed again mentally the way I was in Barcelona. So I did a lot of visualization. And I visualized in extreme detail, like stroke for stroke, the 100-meter race over three months every single day. So it's more than 100 times. Wow. So I still remember the night before the 100 breast, it was the Belgian um, Fred de Berger who yep. won the 100 breast stroke. I, I think mm -hmm. he also did it in a world record. And I remember sitting there thinking, okay, I'm doing that tomorrow, meaning the record. But yeah. I fully also expected either Amanda or Sam Riley would also swim and break my record. It would just be a matter of I better swim faster, that kind of thing. Um, and then in the heats, I did break my own record. They didn't swim that much faster. Um, th they swam actually quite easy in the heats. And then going into the final, obviously, the expectation for me always is the drive is to try and improve my time. And I think I just tried a little bit too hard that evening. I was lucky enough that the wall came soon enough that I touched first before Amanda was there. But, um, and I actually glided into the wall quite a bit. It was such a rookie mistake. I was, I was just very lucky that I had enough. I was ahead enough that it didn't cost me the race. Right. And, but the time was slower than my time from the morning. So people often say, but your face, when you saw it, well, the honest truth is at first, when I looked back, when I looked around, they didn't say first place and put me at the top. They had me number four, Kenny Haynes, and and I wear the glasses to see far. So I'm sitting there now with my eyes that have been in the chlorine for a minute, seven seconds, right. and I'm trying to figure out. And then Amanda said to me, you've won. So I was relieved that I'd won because obviously that was the expectation, but I was yeah. a little bit disappointed at the time. Right. So it was my right. feelings. And then, of course, it's the medal presentation. Nobody's ever prepared any South African in 32 years for this, at, you know, at, at that stage in 44 years, right? Yeah. And I remember standing behind the podium. I don't know if you recall, because you guys also, you got a medal there, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. It was a gold? Yeah, gold. Yeah. So yeah, I was, I I was on the relay. So this is, this is what your gold medal looks like. Yeah, right well there. done. Mine's getting a little, <laughs> mine's a little bit damaged by now already. I, I oh, let yeah, the mine's... kids wear it when I do clinics, so it's. I know I'm the they, same. Um, 20, can you yeah. believe it's been 25 years? Isn't Don't that crazy? Say so loud. <laughs> <laughs> so so okay. anyway, I was standing down there and, and you can't hear the commentator so well, could you? And so I hear this French and I hear people applauding and, and something. So I step up on the podium, but they hadn't called my name yet. <laughs> so I, I stood there <laughs> feeling like a real idiot. Then I hear my name. And I hear this anthem that I don't really recognize because they'd obviously, South Africa had changed a lot in the time that I'd been abroad and we had a new anthem. 
I actually found out subsequently that the anthem, the version they had there was the wrong one, and they had to phone South Africa, and they played the anthem over the telephone from Capital Radio in South Africa. So wow. the anthem is playing, the flag's going up. I'm thinking I should be emotional, but I don't feel anything. And yeah. in all honesty, I was also standing there thinking about Samantha Riley because I honestly expected Sam as the former world record holder would either win or probably get silver. I mean, I, I must admit, we knew about Amanda, but we didn't think she's going to go that fast, oh, yeah. you know? She was so 14, I was kind of yeah. feeling bad. Yeah, so I was feeling bad for Sam while I'm standing on the podium. Um, <laughs> So a lot of mixed feelings. Coming to the 200, a week before the Olympics, I was doing a training camp and we were at Auburn University. And I did a time trial in the 100 and it was really good. And then my coach pulled me aside. He said, so what's the plan for the 200? I said, the 200? Nothing. I've, I've been training for the 100. I have no idea. So he said, but what do you think? Do you think you can get a medal? So I said, I don't know. And I went and sat one side and I thought about it. And then suddenly I felt like I suppose it was also the – Maybe the Holy Spirit saying, you know what, you if you're going to do something, you got to do it with all your heart. And I thought to myself, yeah. well, you know, I'm in the best shape of my life, so I've got to. I can't just dismiss the 200. I've got to really go for it as well. So anyway, fortunately, the 100 was first. Tick that box. So by the time the 200 came, I knew I had the the speed compared to everyone else. Yeah. And the only way I knew how to swim a 200 was absolutely the wrong way, which is dive in and go as fast as you can and hope no one catches you. A very painful strategy. And fortunately for me, again, Amanda didn't catch me. Um, so it's only really later in my career. It's in 1999 that I think for the first time I figured out how to actually pace 200 breaststroke. But um, also I did, at that stage, I didn't know that no one had done the double. Um, and I always joke and say that had I known that, I wouldn't have because yeah. I think ignorance is bliss, you know? That's so, right. No, no, you don't have to deal with the pressure and expectation. Exactly, yeah. That's so, fascinating. yeah, that was 96. Well, it was a great week and it put you on the map and it, it um, you know, made a lot of people aware of, of you and your character and, and what you believe and how you do things. And I, and I think that was a big encouragement to a lot of swimmers. And I know it was to me. Um, one little, do you have a little breaststroke tip? Just, just we take a little tangent here. Do you have a breaststroke tip? You know, like, is there something you do with your kick? Is there something you do with your timing or your, your uh, pull? Uh. Is it? Do you have any little Breast little tidbit you can throw out to us people who are trying to get our breaststroke better? Breaststroke is for strange people. Um, <laughs> it's a very dumb stroke. It doesn't make any sense, and therefore you have to be clever to swim it. That's tip number one. No, on a, on a serious note, I think if you look at the progression of breaststroke over the years, and I think in South Africa, I won't speak for America, but in South Africa, the coaches, I think, we still stuck swimming old technique. They're not watching yeah. the videos. Now I do a lot of stroke correction every weekend for the last decade. And, you know, I watch the top athletes the whole time and, and check out their technique. And if you watch the progression of breaststroke, the kick has become a lot narrower. As you know, the elbows are more forward. I in fact was actually told in 97 to move my elbows forward and come in in front of me. But that felt so small that I thought the old man who was telling me was crazy because no one else yeah. in the world was doing it. Right. And, of course, later on in my career, I started shifting a little bit, but only about that much, which was not, by far not what it is today. But I think my yeah. tip is my personal view. Breaststroke is a little bit like fly, but even more so in breaststroke. If you swim a tired breaststroke or a slow breaststroke, it's not the same stroke. So right. there's, in my mind, absolutely no point mm -hmm. in doing that. So I had my best seasons when I thought I was training for the 100, and I was, I was training shorter distances close to race pace. Now, today we're all familiar with USRPT. I, I wouldn't say I was quite doing USRPT, but any time I did a two-kick pull drill, I was going all out. Right. Any time I swam breaststroke, I was going close to all out. I very rarely did repeat 200s, and when I did, I got overtrained. Um, so it didn't take much. I think in 99, when I broke the first Turner world record, it came off of a season where at least once a week I was going a set of 3050s all out, or not all out, sorry, 3050s long course on a minute. And the first 10 would be drill, but my drill was within a second almost of the actual swimming. Second wow. 10 was swimming the second 50 pace of the 100, more or less. Mm -hmm. 
And then the last 10 was going odd ones all out and even ones 25 all out, 25 easy. And oh, that's cool. when I did the and when I did the 200 breaststroke, the first one that morning at in LA at the Janet Evans Invitational, I actually tried not to swim the race. I actually told my coach, look, I don't like the 200. Let me swim the first hundred all out and learn, you know, and practice the hundred. And he said, how about you actually swim a 200 for once in your life? And if you learn something, you can scratch from the final. So I went in there and I still, I still felt like, oh Lord, you better help me because I'd just done the heaviest weights in my career that yeah. week. And I just went back and forth. I remember turning into the fourth 50 and I thought to myself, I'm not feeling tired. Normally by now I'm dead. I'm not feeling tired. So my coach is going to say, I'm not going hard enough. I better pick it up. Yeah. So I swim faster and I touch the wall. They say it's a pool record. Then they say it's an American open record. And then eventually they say it's a world record. So, of course, the deal is if I do well or I learn something, I can scratch. So I got out the pool, I scratched from the final. <laughs> then they came back and they said, no, you know, it's good, it's good publicity for this meet if you swim again. I said, but I've never broken a record in the evening. And they said, no, you don't have to break the record. You could just swim again. So I said, okay. Yeah. And I didn't even warm down, hey, because I thought I'm going to the beach. This is L.A. And... um so that night again, back and forth, back and forth, and I improved my time. But once you have it, once you have the record, it's just your own PBs, right? And then obviously right. coming off the 200, I knew the hundreds, the hundreds were given then. So yeah, I'd say swim shorter distances with closer to race pace. And my view now, what I've started doing with swimmers is a lot of vertical kick with breaststroke because it's very nice. It's measurable. You can see when you're creating that thrust. Um, also, yeah. the other thing is I, I believe you have to kick with higher turnover and it's way more effort than kicking with a kickboard and having a conversation with your friend because that's what always oh, yeah. happens, right? Right, right, right. And then I'd also, I'd also, so I'd do a lot of that and I would do, if I was going to swim now, right? And I would do a lot of breaststroke pulling with freestyle kick, not with fly kick. Now, traditionally, we always do it with fly kick. The danger with that, there's a, there is some benefits to it because you could do longer sets. You could go hundreds and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. I don't think with a freestyle kick you could. But the problem is with a fly kick, people are, f are thinking fly, so they tend to go down. So you're creating this yeah. habit, which we don't want. So you've always got to think if you do a fly kick, like you want to lunge forward and almost like you want to almost lunge forward and out of the water, like you want right. to take off. So keeping it high on the water. So I would do those components and do a lot of it, then put it together to kick one pull drill and swim some sets where you're doing full-on breaststroke race pace, repeat 50s or stand-ups. I loved stand-ups. I just figured why swim slow? Just if you're going to get in the water and you're going to be wet and you're going to smell like chlorine and the costume is tight, you might as well swim fast. I agree completely. I love that attitude. Yeah. So real quick, we're going to fast forward. 98, you get your first world record. It was in the 50 breaststroke. Is that or no? Hundred was ninety six was your first world record. Then I did the hundred in ninety six twice. Yeah, and then the right. the fifty came in ninety eight. Yes, ninety eight. And uh, so then you had uh, you were the first to hold all three world records at that time. Fifty hundred uh, and two hundred. No, the the, the two hundred only came in ninety nine. That's right. Okay, so finally yeah, ninety nine, yeah. you get all three. So yeah. let's talk about ninety nine real quick. It was eleven world records in three months. The first few happened in L A. Was that the USC yes. meet at the University yeah, of Southern California? Ja yeah, Janet Evans the invitation. Janet, yeah. yeah, yeah. So and it then, was the two breast, two, the two two hundreds, and then twice in the hundred. Yeah. Then I went off to pan packs. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Nine, I was there. Nine nine pan packs in Sydney. Mm -hmm. And uh, that that was a great meet just to try out the the big pool and uh, kind of the dress rehearsal yeah. for the Olympics I, next I year. I, I wish. I wish. Yeah, I wish the Olympics were in ninety nine. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a good one. <laughs> I know. I, I honestly, I honestly thought of you the next year. I thought, geez, you know, she was so on in this pool in '99, and then, and then the next year, mm. you know, and then that just that just happens to all of us. You know, I was yeah. terrible in '99. I was in my biggest slump ever in '98, 90, '99, and you were mm. on this like Holy Spirit, you know, awesome you know, train in, in 99. So I finally came around just in time for Sydney and I, I did my best times in Sydney and yeah. I had to race Ian Thorpe though. So Ian and the Aussie guys get faster. Oh, wow. so, so even though I got faster, they got faster too. And so I got two silver medals, which I'm still thankful for. And actually I'm more proud of those silver medals because I had to get, 
I worked harder and swam faster getting the silver medals than I did the gold medals. Exactly. So, so in a way, those silver medals yeah. mean, mean a lot more to me. But um, yeah. So I can. So you. I don't know if you remember. You. We uh, did a. I, I did this book for the 2008 Olympics. And uh, yeah, it's, a collection, it's a collection of 60 chapters uh, from about 30 diff, 20, 30 different Olympians. And your chapter is one mm -hmm. of my favorites. And it's called Training Worship. And can I just read a okay. couple of paragraphs? And, yeah, yeah. And, and then you can, you can expand on it after I'm done reading it. Um, so you moved to Calgary, Canada after Nebraska. And uh, your, the first day of training, coach gives you six 800s. And you weren't excited about it. And uh, mm -mm. You're like, here, here it goes. My heart sank. I wondered, how does God plan to, to use me if I can't even uh, speak to my fellow athletes? And I'm doing six one eight hundreds by myself, swimming in isolation. I find myself grumbling and complaining. Later that evening, reading First, first Thessalonians 5, 16, be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And after reading that verse, I realized that I hadn't been swimming with a thankful heart. Suddenly it dawned on me that God wanted me to worship him as I trained. I sensed God was saying to me, Penny, as you swim up and down this black line, this is your opportunity to worship me. You don't have to just do it in church. You can do it every lap, every stroke, every single breaststroke kick and pull that you do is the same as raising your hands in church and praising me. I'll teach you to worship me through your talent, through the pool. And then uh, swimming wasn't just about the medals or recognition, doing specific set for my coach or for myself anymore. Instead, I committed to giving my whole being and heart to God in every moment of my swimming. And as I began to focus on God in the water every day, worship became a habit. And soon, regardless of how I felt, I looked forward to going to the pool in the afternoons to worship my Lord. And a year later in mid-June, I competed at swim meet and, and coming off one of my heaviest cycles, uh, even though I was, felt drained, I was completely dependent on God and broke the world record in the 200 breast. And um, anyway, I just I love how you learned to worship through your training. It's not just an hour on Sunday morning. It can be everything we do, how we talk, how we eat, how we swim, every turn, every start. And that's a huge paradigm shift when you can enjoy every practice, every set, every lap like that with the Lord. I mean, boom, a great things are going to happen. And even if they don't, you're going to have a great time doing them. And I think that's really, yeah. really key for a lot of young listeners. When you can find that uh, daily zone with the Lord, it doesn't mean you're going to have zone swims all the time, but you can enjoy him in a training yeah. zone, so to say. So anyway, I just I love this chapter and I love how it it produced such great, great fun things for you that year. So. I mean, is that kind of a synopsis of what that the 11 world records was like? You're just kind of just kind of worshiping the Lord and just seeing what was going to happen at each race. It was. And I think if I go back to I learned a very important I don't know if it's in that chapter. I learned a very important thing that season um, when this all began to happen in Los Angeles. Um, I was also like, what's going on? And a friend of mine was there. And she said to me, imagine it's when you're swimming back and forth, it's like you're worshiping. So imagine someone has a talent to play the piano. It's very natural for them then to use that talent to worship. And they play day in, day out. And then on a specific day, for whatever reason, there's just this stronger anointing of the Holy Spirit as that person worships. And she was saying to me, that's what it was at the swim meet. Because now suddenly my coach was asking me what's going on and he never wanted to hear anything about the Lord, that kind of stuff. You know, it, it opened right. doors for conversation. So now, so now I see what happened there. There was a, a, a swam to honor God and the Holy Spirit was there and he was doing stuff, not me. So I go off to the pan packs and I have the same mindset. And the morning of the 100 breaststroke, I break my own record again. And then the following two races, the semis and the final, I don't. And then the heat of the 200, I don't. And I'm like, Lord, what's, you know, what's going on now? And I felt like he was saying to me, there's a difference between worshiping purely because you want to worship me versus worshiping because you want my Holy Spirit anointing to be there, no matter how noble the, the thoughts. I mean, the idea was <clears throat> let the Holy Spirit come and he can minister to people. So it was still a pure intention, but it was with a caveat. I'd worship so that. 
And right. I was like, wow, okay. So then I, when I dropped it and I, I realized what was happening, then the following two races, world records came again, you know? So, so that's the thing we need to, I think, I think often I see it now anyway, there's a lot of young athletes swimming exceptionally well. And they also are fellow believers and they saying the right things. I worship the Lord and I, all of that. But I, I sometimes feel, looking back on my own career, there's this fine line again where we're doing all of it because somewhere deep down inside we want a result. Right. So it, it, as opposed to, it's almost, I think, looking back on COVID now, I think COVID is actually the lockdown was such a blessing because it just makes you, I mean, obviously the whole world, Christian world, as everybody's talking, you know, is this close to the end and, you know, how long do we still have? So it makes you kind of take stock of things. And I'm just realizing the black and white, the separation of a believer from the world is just so much clearer to me now. And I think sometimes as an athlete, even though that's what we aspire to, we're still living in that gray area. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's a very difficult thing for an athlete at the, at the highest level because you have to focus on your sport. Mm -hmm. But the challenge is to be able to do it knowing that I'm merely doing it because today I believe God's telling me to swim. If he tells me tomorrow not to, then I'm done because it's not my body, it's his. Yeah. So there's that, that deeper degree of worship and relationship that needs to evolve, which I don't know if I ever reached that really, except maybe when I was in the zone that season. But um, it's something I think a lot about today. I, I feel like there's an urgency for people, for Christians to take stock of where we're at and, and are we really 100% sold out to God, to Christ, or are we a Christian because of the X, Y, Z that we so often hear promised? And I don't want to go yeah. into more detail than that. But you know what? I'm well, I absolutely. I just I love that you're, you know, willing to explain that, willing to go there, you know, because we develop ourselves physically and we study technique and we study nutrition and we we know that we need to develop ourselves relationally and be emotionally healthy and learn how to get along with others. But we also needed to explore how to develop ourselves spiritually. And that's what the whole ultimate swimmer thing is about, being strong physically, mentally and spiritually. And we need to explore all of what that means, how to be strong spiritually, because that's the core of our being. That's the essence of who we are. You know, that's that's the inner pipe that you want that to be clean and clear. And when you've got that clean, clear pipe with God and our maker, you know, that's a good place to be. And then. You know, yeah. then you're more you're healthy, more healthy emotionally, and then you can really be freed up physically. You're released physically to be your very best. And so I appreciate you that you are exploring all three areas, spiritual, mental and physical, to get the full expression mm -hmm. of your athletic talent out. And I think that's wonderful that you were able to do that. And it's a great example for a lot of people. So thank you for sharing that journey. And then but of course, God, you know, he takes us on journeys ups and downs and we don't always understand everything and Sydney the next year at the Olympics only a bronze medal mm -hmm. so give us a little yeah. insight on, on what you were experiencing that week there too before you get to the week there too is a spiritual lesson to learn mm -hmm. so it's not an excuse but it is a fact this is what happened a teammate I think I don't know if you know about it but a teammate got into a car accident was hospitalized at the time, the Canadian squad was at their trial, so I was there alone. And the parents invited me to go to the hospital, and pretty much this girl was in a fellow breaststroker, was in a coma. And her parents weren't believers, but throughout the week, I kind of felt it's my responsibility to be there and pray. And the more this happened, I, I kind of at that point thought, maybe this is why God has me in Canada, because of this situation. Wow. And the parents did make a commitment. To this day, I will never know, was it for real or was it out of sort of let me try everything attitude. But nonetheless, it got to the point where they would even ask me to speak with them to the doctors. And they asked me on the Friday night, should they switch the machines off or not? And of course, I said yes, because if there's going to be a miracle, it's going to happen either way. So I was in the room when they switched the machine off. The whole time, this is the week before the world short course. The whole time, I did not think it's going to affect me at all. Um, and I didn't go to the short course because of the memorial and the team hadn't been there and this 
team psychologist thought maybe I could be helpful. And so anyway, I put the swimming on the back burner. I did train well in that whole week. Yeah. But in hindsight, I remember I got on the flight off the day after the memorial to fly home to South Africa. And the moment I was away from everybody else that had anything to do with the situation, I just got physically ill, started throwing up. I thought I had a bug. So I came home to Olympic trials. It was okay. But from there, because I was feeling like it's one step forward, two steps back, you start making decisions that are based a little bit on panic. So I was willing to try new things where in 96, I wouldn't have, for instance, sleeping in a, in a, a, an altitude tent, that kind of stuff. I would never have tried new things in 96, but now because I'm a little bit desperate, I'm trying different things. And the long and short of it is I just feel like even though physically I trained well, physically I recovered like 99, emotionally I didn't really, I think, recover as well as I should have. And the result is when I got to Sydney, I had no legs. You know, it was, was, it was done. But yeah. I'm not sorry for what happened. However, I do think because of that, I made other decisions that were not wise. Um, and I take the full responsibility for that. But I think the lesson to be learned is my calling at that point in my career was to get on with my swimming career and do the best I could. That doesn't mean I shouldn't have gone to the hospital, but I, I think I put too much importance on my role spiritually there than was necessary. It's not me anyway, it's God. Yeah. And so I got caught up in this. And I think even the same thing in Sydney, I got caught up with going to Hillsong Church, which after everything I know now today, I wouldn't go there. But anyway, going, um, you know, going there and getting everybody to go to church and getting the groups together in the village and all of that's nice, but that's not why I was at the Olympics. So I think there's a lesson for young Christians. When you, when you go to the Olympics or you go to your competition, uh, you get on with what you are supposed to do there. The Holy Spirit will do the rest. You don't have to consciously, consciously be trying to make it happen, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's, that's a big so, part of the maturation process of being a good steward of the gifts we've been given is, you know, how do we take care of business? How do we do what we've been hired and sanctioned to do? At the same time, how do we enjoy the Lord and enjoy the people He's put around us? And so that's a, it's a really fine line, mm. and it takes a lot of it takes a lot of yeah. maturation. And we never stop learning these things. So, so yeah. I appreciate you sh sharing that journey. I do remember the uh, the uh, the fellowships and the Bible studies in the Olympic Village. I think uh, I think it was y'all's building, the South African building, had the best time. We we would go there and have some great Bible studies at the uh, at the Sydney Olympics. Um, yeah. So, thank you for being a part of that. But um, so 2001, you retire and uh, incredible mm -hmm. career. And then you transitioned into some other business opportunities, speaking opportunities. Uh, you and I have gotten have a similar trajectory where we got to do some TV things, some motivational speaking things and establish some other side businesses and uh, consulting. And uh, it's been really rewarding to take our platform and parlay that into other things that can help other people and other entities. So maybe you can give a little synopsis of all the fun stuff you've been able to do the last 20 years so i think when i first retired came home i, I didn't want anything to do with swimming um which is pretty normal in south africa for most of us yeah. and so i i tried my hand at the business world a bit but i was just sort of like the spectator watching my business partner and, an, and another business partner in that business get on with it and then i slowly began moving more into the corporate space of doing um, inspirational speaking, workshops, that kind of stuff, which I really, I found I really love teaching. I think, um, I think I never would have thought it, but it's something I really love doing. And so with time though, I started, I had one coach that kept asking me, will I come down and work with these breaststrokers? And I didn't want to, I kept saying no, but in the lead up to the 2010 World Cup that was hosted in South Africa, if you did not talk about soccer, football, you got no work. So it's like there was this real dip in the business. And actually, my business partner said to me, you know, God's going to take you back into swimming. And I was so angry when she said it to me. I was like, tearful. No, I don't want anything to do with swimming. And so, but the moment I walked onto pool deck and I worked with those swimmers, I felt like I had that gut feel again, like I was back home and so out of that grew 
us doing swim clinics, which again, the, the real agenda behind the swim clinics was to just get the kids there so we can take them into the classroom and talk to them about the motivational aspect and the mental toughness aspect and, and all of those life skills, et cetera. And then on the swimming side, focusing really on the technique aspect. Um, so I fully agree with you. Technique is paramount. Um, conditioning is secondary. Um, so, and then from there, I went into doing a lot of individual coaching with regards to stroke technique. And of course, sometimes it's also the mental stuff. So for the last decade, that's been a big, big part of what we've been doing. Besides still doing the corporate stuff, um, I'd say the core business route now is actually based on the swim clinics, camps, and the individual coaching. And then beyond that, I'm involved with FINA all these years still. So I'm the chair on the athletes committee currently. Um, and then for the last two years, I've been on the athlete voice. So that's been fun. It's been a real learning curve. Nice to deal with some people who are actually from the real world and not just sport as well. So it's been good. That's good. Well, I appreciate you being a, a representative and ambassador on those different committees and in that level, because it's really important because, you know, FINA has its, and, and all these organizations have their good and not so good parts. And so it's really important that good people like yourself are in those, in those organizations and giving the athlete voice and the athlete perspective. So I, I really appreciate you doing that. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the ISL and pro swimming? Would you give any advice? I mean, I think you would have been great at the ISL if it was oh, around. I think it would have been fun. In your heyday. It would have been a lot of fun. But um, yeah, I think what's great about the ISL is it's giving those guys the similar experience to what we all had on the collegiate, you know, collegiate circuit. That yeah. environment where yeah. this team camaraderie and um, it's this frequent short course, fast competition. So I think all of that's great. Um, and I think I don't see a reason why the ISL cannot coexist with FINA. I think the way that the introduction of the ISL was made, there was definitely some things going on behind the scenes. And it was unfortunate. There was manipulation. Um, I, I'm not going to take sides. I just think that there was an agenda and it played out. And the, the athletes got caught up in the middle of it. And it's unnecessary. Hopefully, going forward, it would continue to be a little more amicable the way it is. But I think, yeah, for the young athletes who have an opportunity to compete in the ISL, why not? Um, I know also, though, I've spoken to some top athletes, um, like in the very top in the world right now. And one of them said to me, the ISL is fun, but it's not real swimming. It's short course. You know, he's he is still very much a long course swimmer. And I have to echo that as well. But it is a nice way to to maintain professionalism in sport. And I think especially for those athletes also coming to the end of their careers, it at least gives them a little bit more longevity. Yeah. And all the short course yards racing we did didn't negatively affect our long course that much. So I don't think no. short course meters for certain windows of time is, shouldn't compromise their long course no. preparation. No. If it, you know, if it times just right. No, so, I think it's just, I think it's just the way that some athletes perceive it in terms of importance. I think this mm -hmm. person would prefer if it was long course, cause it would be a, a lot more challenging. It would be a lot more real swimming. Specifically, right. if you're a breaststroker and you know you can have freestylers and butterfly swimmers competing in the breaststroke just because of the underwaters, you know? Yeah, yeah, so, that's true. Yeah. Oh, real quick, the thought I had is you had some pretty pretty amazing contemporaries from South Africa um, that went on to do some amazing things. Reich Needling, Charlene, Roland. Uh, I mean, kind of, a, kind of a, a cool class of South Africans went on to do some, some pretty amazing things. Any... Uh, do you keep up with them? And Yeah, I do. Um, Rake, I, I see a couple of times every now and then. Roland drops me a message every now and then when he has a comment to make <laughs> about things in the world of sport. Um, Charlene, I did see a few times, but in the last few years, uh, if she has been in South Africa, I'm not aware of it. Um, I suppose the princess duties are very overwhelming. Um, so, yeah, I've kind of lost touch with her a little bit. Yeah. Well, I just I, I, we have good memories of all being together at the Pan Pax in Sydney and then, of course, the Olympics in Sydney. And so yeah. I remember really getting to enjoy you and your teammates uh, in that season. And so I'm, I'm really thankful. 
that you're letting us in on your insights of your career and your life. So real quick, lightning round of your favorite things. Um, favorite color? Blue. Cool, me too. Favorite city you've ever been to, like just as a tourist or as a, as a visit? Mm, that's not an easy one. Oh, man. I'd say my f one of my favorite places would be Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe. You can't call oh, it wow. a city. There's nothing there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. that that yeah i bet that's amazing yeah favorite pool you've ever raced in you have a favorite favorite pool favorite venue i don't know i think sydney was one of the best that i raced in but yeah. of course atlanta will always be special right yeah no same with me same with me and uh, favorite event of the 50 100 200 which is your favorite i think the 100 yeah that's and good. that's why I was able to cross over all three distances. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite food? Or do you have a favorite uh, thing you, you like to order or a favorite most, thing you like to prepare? Most food. <laughs> I love <laughs> food. Um, what do I like to I I'm actually a little bit on a Mexican food uh, kick yes. right now. Yes. So, do you, do uh, they have do they have Chipotle or Qdoba? In, in Pretoria, you know, where you build your own burrito, you build your own bowl of yeah, uh, rice, rice beans. Does it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's okay. one place that does it, but we don't have a lot of Mexican restaurants yet in South Africa. So okay, that's fascinating. Yeah. So you just do you get fajitas or enchiladas or what do you do? You order something? No, I just do, do wraps. I, I, yeah, okay. Sure, like wraps. I say, I live on a farm. There's a couple of other people. Yeah, I'm hardly ever. Yeah, I use the washing machine, then I leave. But when I am, yeah, I don't do the cooking. I do the dishes. So one of the That's meals cool. is, is uh, something like a burrito. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. And um, what do you do for exercise now? What's your favorite exercise now? I can't say. Nothing. <laughs> it's really bad. It's really bad. Just walking, live cool. walking up and down the side of the pool. I think that's about the, the sum total of it. No, I, sometimes uh, I'll – I'm not good at running. I hate it. I have some gym mm -hmm. equipment. So I was very diligent with that um, for a few years and then came the world champs in Budapest. And, you know, after going to the gym once or twice, I realized if I sit in the sauna, I can build up a nice sweat as well. I don't actually have to go in the gym. So there began this downward spiral of, um, of yeah. So that's something well, I need to start doing again. I'm not so diligent at this point. That's cool. Well, yeah. I, I, I want to encourage you. I do my 30 minute swim most every day. And, wow. Uh, I do 30, like 50s. I, I get in like once a year, but okay. <laughs> well, I'm thankful for you, for your career, and uh, you most most thankful for your character and your example of uh, trusting the Lord with the process and worshiping him through the training, through the racing, and then just seeing what happens and trusting him with the results. And sometimes it's great and amazing, 11 world records in three months, and then sometimes you know, it's not what we think, but that's okay too, because mm. that's that's ultimately not where our worth and our value is. It's not in the medals. It's, exactly. you know, in, in the friendships we've made, the lessons we've learned and the memories we've made. So, and you've made a lot of good ones. And so thanks for sharing them with us today. So my pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity, Josh. I want to take a moment to tell you about my favorite swim cap, the hammerhead swim cap. It's the safest, fastest, longest lasting, most comfortable swim cap in the world. It's one of a kind patented honeycomb shock absorbing technology will prevent concussions. And the hammerhead cap has no wrinkles to ensure top speed with the least resistance. And it's super comfortable. That's easy to get on and easy to get off and it will never tear. This is the last cap you will ever need to buy. Safety and speed all at hammerheadswimcaps.com. Thank you for joining us on this Ultimate Swimmer podcast. We hope you enjoyed hearing from these Olympians and life champions and how certain habits and decisions help them on their journey, and they can help you too. If there is an Ultimate Swimmer from your team that you would like to nominate that we can recognize on our show, just email me at josh at joshdavis.com. That's josh at joshdavis.com and tell us about how your ultimate swimmer is making a difference in your swimming community. And that's the goal, to make a difference and swim with purpose. Not only are you getting better, but you're helping those around you get better too. When you realize you were born for the water, born for greatness, 
and born to serve others, you are on your way to becoming an ultimate swimmer. I'm Josh Davis. Until next time, keep streamlining and keep smiling. See you around the pool soon.